guys, check this out. I'm at the home of Yoder Smokers, where my Yoder Wichita was built. Look at that. We're fixing to go take a tour, folks. Stick around. Man, this is Joe Phillips, vice president, co-founder of Yoder, yeah, Yoder Smokers. He's gonna explain where my Yoder Wichita came from. Take away, Joe. All right, Friday. Thanks, man. Uh, this is a torch we had built in Italy, uh, specifically built to cut the body from the of our smokers. Uh, so the way it works, years ago we cut everything by hand. Everything had a pattern. Three or four guys got set up, drug a 40-foot smack in. We cut everything the length and all the door openings by hand. Uh, we worked with a company in Italy to design our torch so we could load a 40-foot smack of material. CNC That's got to be amazing to watch. Yeah, it's very, very cool to watch. And now, how, how much time did it save you getting a machine like this? Uh, you know, with hand cutting everything. In our current production capacity, it would take 10 guys to keep up with hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very cool. What else we got? Let's go around the corner. All right, we're in the weld shop. This is where all the bike comes. Our welders take, fit the door, strap it all, hand weld everything, and fit it together. This is the making of a huge 24 inch Durango is going to Europe. Firebox goes here? Nope. This saddles to the vertical chamber. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And then the firebox will come to the other side. I got you. Uh, this fish now is also cut on the CNC tool. Interesting. Is this is it cut smooth like this? Yep. Oh, it is. Yep. That's the way it's cut. Like a baby pop. Yep. It is. That's cool. Yep. That's a great job. Very nice. So, no process through here. Uh, this happens in two stages. You we got. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. You've got guys that, that trap and weld. Okay. So, their responsibility is to fit the chamber door to the body and then they put the exterior strap on and weld everything up. Mm. Then it comes to the assembly welders. Okay. And the assembly welders hang the fireboxes, weld the stands on, put all the interiors in. Um, then it moves down here to QA and prep. steel shot. Nice. So the tungsten carbine shot side specifically designed to our parts so we get the right surface adhesion for paint. Mm -hmm. uh, this machine, every pellet grill part and 85% of the wood parts go on this, on this machine prior to paint. Um, really simple. At the moment, we're running hopper back. Here in a few moments, the guys will pin these, close the door, turn it on, the table rotates, and it'll throw shot at the park for about two and a half minutes. Is it polishing it? Is that the purpose? Or is it, it giving a Creating a rough surface, okay. rough clean surface for the paint to stick. Okay, I'm like it. Okay. You can see the table rotates. And then preps the part, and then the part moves into bank. Makes sense. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Did y'all used to do that by hand? Hand sanded everything. Oh, just with sandpaper, regular old fashioned stuff. DA and uh -huh. sandpaper. Okay. Um, a pit went first with a wire wheel. Then 80 grit, then 200 grit, every pit we built. We just got to the magnitude we're building too many pits. Yeah. A, you didn't have the square footage, or B, you couldn't hire enough humans to 
prep all the product. We paint, in a given day, we'll paint about 80 to 100 bits. That's quite impressive. Yeah. That time, includes, time saver and it's more efficient? It's a better product. Yeah. A human cannot equal the predictable surface finish that comes out of that yeah. machine. That's getting in all the nooks and crannies and everything yeah. else. Yeah. Right. Very nice. Yeah. What else you got for me? Paint line. Wichita was running that big booth. They just roll in and shoot. Uh, this is our pellet grill line. Okay. There's 1,784 parts a day that run across this line. Man. To keep up with the production schedule. So the pellets are your most, uh, uh, most purchased? Yeah, they're our highest volume. And the 640 is probably the number one. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Okay. Very good. oven runs at 450 degrees every we'll get about two and a half lines of parts in the oven the oven will run about 45 minutes so we're baking that coating mm -hmm. onto the part and it just gets one coat of paint i mean i mean two in here i guess but it so, goes in there and bakes on y'all don't do anything else to the paint surface no. okay then we're done okay that much paint cure so we yeah. can assemble it right in the old days we would paint one day and it would have to set five to seven days before okay. we could put bolts on it, work on it, because the paint wasn't cured. It's cured to the touch in about two hours, but it isn't cured to work on. I don't think it's metal. For six or seven days, depending on the humidity and outside temperature. Okay. So everything runs through the oven. Not a, anything we build that gets black paint on it doesn't go in that oven comes out of the oven, things are hot, they've got to set. Your surface temperature on a 640 will be about 250 degrees when it comes out of the oven. It finds this one in the assembly process. Yeah, there's a bunch lined up back there ready to, yeah. ready to go. Uh, they'll get boxed. Oh, okay. So these are all awaiting boxing. You've got small parts assembly, hoppers over here. And this is the final assembly stage here. Then everything comes down the box line, gets it to the and then moves back into the About 12 QA points in this area here, where we test fire pits, we check thermal couples, igniters, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll, you'll test the uh, offset stick burner. When I originally I mean, built them. Yeah, did you? Okay. Uh, in terms of building a fire in them. Now, every offset stick burner, you know, butterflies get tested, door gaps get tested, everything goes through a QA process. Well, I guess, I guess if you have a, a, a fancy machine cutting all the metal, you don't have to worry about it being a little warped and, yeah, you know, the door not quite fitting right. The welding process causes some movement, yeah. so we still hand fit 90% of that, but I'll kind of check. Okay. So even your wood pits go through an inspection process. Oh, okay. We've got a 54-point inspection process, serial number, customer. We're checking for door gaps, paint, all the uh, correct pieces being inside the pit. Every pit's got a sales order in it so we can match what was ordered to mm -hmm. the customer. This is the QA area. on it, which in this case QA is not stamped off. Each area of the department has a stamp with an employee number. Gotcha. All QA stamps are red and there's four of them. Oh, okay. So it takes a red QA stamp to get into shipping. And 54 points to inspect. Yep. That's a lot. That's that's 
like that. Yep. I know my I go to Wichita is awesome. I'm not everything closes nice, it feels right, it cooks fantastic. I'm just so impressed with the quality. Well thank you. No, thank you. Great job. Oh, there's a little one here. Yep. That's I like this. <laughs> there you go. Most of these are going to be individuals. Cool. And the grate comes up and down? Yep. Great grate. Let's fold that up. Okay. Oh, all the way. I guess it was somebody else who got in on this one. Australian fans, there you go. They ship. Yep. So you can do Australia, you do Canada. Uh, Canada, most of Europe, UK, uh, into Mexico, Canada. Starting to move into, we'll call it India. Uh, okay been doing quite a bit of stuff over in that part of the world lately. So if I do have some fans from overseas, where's the best place to order each, a Yoder smoker? Each country has a distributor. Oh, okay. okay. So if you jump on our website, type your country in. Yodersmokers.com. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, it'll tell you who the distributor is in, in your country. Good to know. There you go for those of you that have asked. Joe, I just wanted to ask this question if you you don't mind. A lot of my viewers who have purchased Yoder offsets, they have asked me about that heat management plate. Sure. Mine is set up, and, and the, my pre preferred way to do it is to set it up so that you got 50 degree variance to 75 degree variance from end to end within the cooking chamber. But I've never tried to get my cooking chamber to be totally even across the board. How would you suggest that my fans do that? Because they ask me this all the time, and I just don't want to reconfigure mine. Sure. So if they get a new offset from Yoder, how should they configure that heat management plate? A couple of things. As you talk about completely even across the grate, that's really hard because you have an offset fire. So let's talk about getting it within an acceptable range, say 20 degrees. That's quite acceptable, yeah. <clears throat> On the right-hand side, you're always going to be a little more radiant because that's where the fire is. The heat management plate's in, it's going to radiate a little heat. So, so what's going to happen in, in a Wichita, for example, with a heat management plate is on the right-hand side, you're going to have a little bit of a bottom cook, and as you move to the left, it's going to be a top-down cook. So you're going to cook just a little bit different right to left. As you talk about managing that temperature from left to right and top to bottom, you want to control your air intake and the outtake of your air. If you think about right brain, left brain, as you back the stack off, you're moving the airflow backwards. Mm -hmm. You're not allowing the heat to flow through the pit, so you're backing it up. 
if you think about the air intake on the firebox, the more open it is and the more efficient the fire, the more heat you're moving to the left-hand side of the chamber. Okay. So you'll want to play a balancing act in between your intake damper and your stack. I typically, if I want to be pretty even in the pit, top to bottom and right to left, I'm going to run the damper about half shut and the stack cap about a third to a half shut. That really slows that air down and allows you to really efficiently burn that fire. So that way you're not seeing spikes in temperatures. The other thing that's really important in cooking in an offset wood pit, the, the more food you put in it, the more BTUs you're gonna consume. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. The, the tighter that meat gets, the more you're gonna force the heat to want in. Okay. So, so you want to allow it a little space. You're always going to cook. Typically, you're going to cook the hottest at the stack. So if you have a second shelf, the upper left is going to tend to run 15 or 20 degrees hotter. The beautiful thing about an offset wood pit is every piece of meat's a little different. So you got one brisket that's going to finish in 10 hours. The next one's not going to finish till 11 and a half. Happens to everybody, yeah. Um, your wife puts cake in the oven, right? Right. Sets it at 350 degrees and sets a timer. She's going to walk to that cake with a toothpick and check it. She is. It's what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, cooking a piece of meat's kind of the same way. That oven's going to have variance in it. That's why you're checking. Well, a wood pit's going to be the same way. You've got a fire that you're controlling, so your ability to efficiently burn fire and provide it predictable fuel is really important. We see a lot of guys who will go buy some wood to start with, and then they'll go to the neighbors and find an old tree that they're going to give to them. Well, that kennel dried wood they bought and that old tree laying on the ground aren't going to burn the same. No, no they're, they're going to be a little different. Right. So the ability to manage that airflow through the pit, you can take any of our pits and make them do whatever you want. A good base, got to have a cold base. That's what that's where the heat comes from. That is the most important. Yeah. Maintain that coal base. If you lose it, then you begin to create separation from right to left. Mm -hmm. And always going to happen. Right. Maintain your coal base, understand your pit and its airflow, and then use the dampers. That's why we put them there. Mm -hmm. Play with that a little bit. You know, I, I don't ever run a damper more than about two-thirds shut on the stack. But at times, I'll run my firebox damper almost all the way close if I want to be 200 degrees. Hmm. See, I usually just run my stack all the way open and strictly adjust the heat within the pit by the intake on the uh, mm -hmm. firebox. Certainly do that. And I, I do get, I guess, less smoke flavor because there's more airflow. That's right. Okay. So if I want more smoke flavor, slow that airflow Slow that down. air down. Hold okay. it in that chamber a little while. Yeah. Um, perfect example is a pellet grill. The reason a pellet grill smokes is because you're dropping raw fuel on a fire. Yeah. It'll smoke for a little bit and it'll quit. So the ability to feed pellets predictably causes that smoke profile to happen. The exact same thing exists in a wood pit. The bigger the coal base, the hotter the coal base, the less smoke you're going to produce. Okay. The more air you're moving through it, the chemical process in the meat and the cooking in the salts will cause a smoke flavor to happen. But if you want big, heavy smoke, slow the air down. Slow that cook down. Let the smoke linger on the meat. Let it linger there. Yeah. If you want to cook a little hotter and faster, open it up, let things move through it. Um, it's kind of like driving a car and pulling up to a stoplight. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You ease into the throttle. Right. We're running the wood pit the exact same way. You want to ease into that throttle and, and set your cruise control where you want it. Okay. The cruise control is just the entry point and the exit point. Hmm. Very interesting. And the, the heat management plate itself, should it be all the way against the inside wall of the firebox? Or should it, does it even matter how far it is? Yeah, it you know? does. Um, and, and also, it's got a lip on one end. Should yeah. that lip be the lip should within curl, the firebox? The lip should curl under the ash seal. In okay. every pit, there's a rectangular piece of plate welded against the firebox wall right. at about a 15 degree angle. That is there, as the air moves up, it's going to want to rise. Of course, yeah. It's there to catch the ash. 
can stop the ash from getting on the top. Oh, of your that's knees. good. I didn't never know that. That's okay. what it's there. For. Okay. It should lift under it. Okay. That'll give you a predictable radiant spot of about 20 degrees hotter on the right, and then progressively going to get cooler to the left. So what I'm doing there is choking that airflow down. Right. I'm causing it to starve itself just a little bit so it produces the smoke you want. I'll take my Kingman at times, and I'll slide my plate three or four inches away from that. Okay. I'll leave a little bit of gap. Let's say I've got chicken on the upper right-hand side. I want that heat to come up and escape because I want it 350 degrees out on the upper right, but well, I want my brisket over here at 250. Right. So the versatility and the ability to play with that is really neat. The good thing about our pits is it's capable of any of it. So I've got mine like one inch or so, maybe an inch and a half away from the wall, mm -hmm. or away from that uh -huh. ash catch thing you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how I get my even 50 degree variance. But depending on what you're cooking and how you want to cook, you could move the heat management plate, Yep. Uh, adjust the intake and the outtake, yep. you know, the smokestack and the firebox. Yep, that's uh, right. Learn your pit. Learn your pit, that's very important. Does it matter whether you're doing the Cheyenne or the, uh, the Kingman or my Wichita, as far as what you just described, is there very much variance? I would think not. It, there's a little bit of variance just because as the tube gets bigger, the air is going to flow slightly slower. So in a Cheyenne, okay. you have a little tube. Everything is sized for that body. Right. It's a proportion intake to outtake. But naturally, the air is going to move through it faster because there's less cubic volume to fill. Okay. So it's going to be quicker to react than, say, a Kingman. A Kingman's going to be a little slower to react than a Wichita. Fundamentally, they're all the same. The reaction time changes in between. So is the size volume of the air going? Okay. The cubic volume inside the body. That really makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for explaining you bet. that. And, Anytime. Uh, do you have anything else that you would like to share? Thanks, everybody, for cooking on the product. Got any questions, reach out to us, let us know. Uh, should they just go to yodasmokers.com? Yep. Okay, sounds good. All right. Call their customer service, wonderful customer service as well if you need to. And, uh, Joe, I can't thank you enough. You really, bet. really enjoy the tour. Yep, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Hope to yep. see you again soon. Yes, sir. We'll be back, folks. So there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the Yoder Smokers facility as much as I did. I really had a great time and it's so wonderful seeing where they make their pits and how they go through them with a fine tooth cone to make sure that they are the best that they can be before they get shipped out to you. Really had a great time. I got to thank uh, Joe Phillips. He's the co-founder of Yoder Smokers and the vice president. He's the one that runs the show there in the facility. He, he was gracious enough to take some precious time out of his busy schedule to give a personalized tour to me and Justin from Baby Bag Maniac. So, Appreciate that, Joe. Appreciate it very much. And thanks for answering my questions. I learned a lot. I really did learn a lot, and I hope to bring that knowledge to you fine folks that are watching this. So thanks, Joe. Also have to thank Josh Carey, who was the camera person for this shoot. I was struggling trying to shoot video and to ask Joe questions while we were doing the tour, so Josh stepped up and took my camera, and he was shooting the footage for us. So thanks very much, Josh. Also, the opening scene, that footage was shot by Justin from Baby Bag Maniac. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate you letting me use your footage, man. We had a great time. Learned a lot. Hope that you did as well. Hope you enjoyed this kind of tour. And if you want to see more of this kind of stuff from my channel, please support T-Roy Cooks. This video was possible. It was made possible from you guys who's helped support T-Roy Cooks in the past. Check out the links down below in the description. Just hit show more and you can help support T-Roy Cooks. And also you'll find Yoder Smoker's website there. Hope you get you a Yoder Smoker if you haven't got one already. Wonderful, wonderful smokers, folks. Also, Justin from Baby Bag Maniacs, links down there. Got to thank Justin for joining me on the trip. We had a great time. If y'all like this kind of stuff, please do help support T-Roy Cooks. I'll get out and do more things, and uh, we'll bring you more content. Y'all like this kind of stuff, y'all give me some thumbs up. If you're not a sub yet, hope you go ahead and subscribe. Hope you share the video. And when you do, please tell all your friends that T-Roy cooks responsibly. Cheers, everybody.